Today in Sister Outsider, we're exploring black men and masculinity. A lot of um, a lot of the literature, a lot of the debate, a lot of you know the reflection on questions around masculinity, in particular, in, particularly in relation to um, men of color, black men, etc., is very very American focused. I feel, um, and so I wanted to contextualize these experiences within a British landscape and really you know create a space that you guys can openly discuss engage with one another as well as men um, about some of these issues that that may or may not be affecting you the first question I want to throw out there is what do you guys feel um, are the issues affecting uh, men of color in Britain today I think the issues in the public realm I think they were documented you know, stop yeah. and search in the relationship between black communities in the state then obviously you've got unemployment, discrimination in the workplace, and also other aspects of social capital that many, many black communities just don't have. I think black communities, black males in particular, are disproportionately working class. So there is, you know, other class disenfranchisement that affects, you know, black males in that space as too. I'm interested particularly in looking at self harm and the. Uh, diversity of what self-harm actually means or could mean and I'm talking about self-harm in the sense where obviously suicide rates amongst young men are high. Out of every four suicides three of them are male and out of every three um, two of them are black males. Also there's a disproportionate um, difference in, in between black males and other groups in regards to uh, mental health. Black people are uh, Forty-four percent, approximately, more likely to be um, put into a mental health uh, unit. So there's also kind of that psychological aspect about it. I think living in a patriarchal society, uh, I'd be bold enough to say that in society, people don't really care what men think, and more so what black men think or feel in particular. So um, if, as a black man, you d you don't have any emotional outlet, black men are kind of um, sexualized very much so um, kind of seen as the brute or athlete kind of figure and even though this is the kind of image that descends traditionally from the more um, kind of periods of slavery and colonialism on, up until now remnants of it still do exist very much so mm. in society and the mainstream media to the extent where if uh, a young black man doesn't feel comfortable in these roles, mm. then he his manhood is almost immediately negated. I think you raise a really um, kind of powerful point there, which is actually the the outlets in which um, black men can actually express themselves. It's an area where both hip hop and spoken word poetry are actually um, coming up, and and they're being used as outlets by young black men to. Uh, to express themselves, I think Definitely. you're an example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from my own personal experience, I started writing poetry um, in, in my teens, and I hid that for a very long time because I knew it was an unmasculine thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it wasn't something that was considered manly, particularly being a young black inner city uh, boy. So, having found that the strength. Because I think it does require a certain amount of strength to be able to break from, break free from the, the certain stigmas that are associated with hypermasculinity of young black men. Having found the strength to kind of overcome that and express, I feel it's liberated myself in the way that I think and feel. But still, in the younger generation, you can see how certain cycles repeat themselves. And even though for someone my age who's in their mid twenties can all of a sudden feel free to express myself, it's almost a decade or two too late where this should be a constant, uh, continuous process from, from childhood. So it's kind of like an arrested sort of development where you know, you're emotionally stunted or spiritually stunted. You were talking about how um, patriarchy or in society, uh, it, sh it shapes and affects how black men see themselves. I want you to talk more, a bit more about that. What do you mean by how they see themselves and then therefore see others? Black men are still men, and this, you know, is a word that you know says man is man is the king. Man runs things, man rules things. You know, the dominance of man is almost taken as a given. Men should be the head of the household. Men should be the head of things. That's just what people. That's just what we're raised to believe. And that's a part of patriarchy. I feel that, particularly about the way that black 
youthhood, you could call it, has been depicted and black males have been depicted mm -hmm. as, you know, scary, dangerous. The irony is that people always draw the perspective of a, a middle class white person seeing a group of black boys getting scared and crossing the road. But people forget, actually, there are other black boys who internalise that same perspective and then see the same black boys across the road. And rather than cross the road, I think, well, let me tool myself up and be ready to do all these guys. Mm -hmm. And so for me, then, this becomes an issue of self-harm, of internalising particular perspectives and almost fearing yourself. And therefore, when you see yourself and other people, you almost already are on the tap because you're trying to, you know, hold your ground because that's what men do. Nothing more than clash of masculinity. People feeling scared, so feeling like they've got to empower themselves to go out there and fight. Essentially, the irony is that when you break it down, what they're really fighting about, what they're scared of, what they're scared of is themselves. Isn't it the hierarchy of masculinity? Because essentially what you're saying is that it's the white man saying to society that it's the black man who is this kind of, you know, animalistic almost tendencies who hang around in packs and walk down the streets and carry weapons and so on. And those are the people to fear. As long as people are looking to the kind of lowest common denominator, because the, the people on the street are what people are scared of. People don't think about people in ivory towers who are making loads of money and extorting people and starting wars and so on. Um, actually, as long as your mind is, is, is over there, they can do whatever they want. So the, the, the fear that one young black man has of another, of, of another group of black people is also part of a hierarchy which goes right to the top. If you look at the media, for instance, if we look um, around 2008 to 2009, that year particularly, there was a lot of coverage in terms of knife crime and, and youth robberies, etc. particularly in London. And it was almost every week. And on the news, we consistently saw that it was a young black male who was involved, who either got stabbed or who was the perpetrator. But if you look at the, the crime statistics uh, in the UK, the most violent places in regards to knife crime and violent crime uh, are like Glasgow. Glasgow. That's the most violent place. So imagine, mm. right, if the coverage was instead young white males, uh, what kind of effect that would have in society? You can't pretend that, you know, the representation of black males, especially black youths, is not one where, you know, it's not one historically of, you know, muggers and criminals, the criminal class, I think the best representation came from Starkey. Starkey's little, I, I like to watch Starkey's clip because I just find it hilarious, but the truth is that what he's saying is a long haul perspective that many people have. What I would be worried about is creating a binary between, you know, the working class or what some people would have once called, you know, the long term proletariat. If you read, you know, Owen Jones's Chabs or something like that, you know, there is a depiction of these people as well. The only difference is, of course, is that whiteness is almost seen as invisible. Mm. So even though whiteness is real, the way that they portray it, it's not the whiteness that creates leads to criminality in those spaces. It's you know working it's, class, it's, it's, it's their working classness that mm. they don't want to work with their own little subclass of something. That's the way they're portrayed. I wouldn't I wouldn't quite draw a binary there because they're I'm not I'm not a yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, drawing a binary or saying that they're uh, they're dichotomous. But yeah, I'm saying yeah. from from a young black male's point of view. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that would make a distinct difference in how you saw other young black males and how you saw yourself. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Jubar's theory of uh, double consciousness, okay. for instance, you know, we do not see ourselves as young black men through our own eyes, yeah. essentially. We're, yes, we're, yeah. We're, 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 the fan on says the same thing as well. Uh, exactly. So we're, we're kind of um, defined by how society yeah, tells yeah. us to see ourselves. Definitely. So if society is scared of the black man yeah. and we are conditioned by society to think of it, yeah. we will also kind of reinforce that. Yeah, yeah. Now, in regards to the pack mentality and hang around in groups, that isn't something that came out of nowhere. It was a defense mechanism yeah. because we know that very much so in in the diaspora in, in the West, especially here in the UK, mm -hmm. you needed to hang around in a pack to defend yourself. As yeah, a yeah. There's a kind of like a, a, a triple oppression, oppression, if you like. So you have to defend yourself from uh, white racist groups, you have to defend yourself from the police, and now it's advanced to the point where you have to defend yourself from other young black males. Mm -hmm. So this creates a kind of like hyper-masculine young black man who has to be equipped, protected, and ready to take on the world, mm -hmm. no matter what. It's almost like when you're able to teach people perspective, you don't even need to teach them anymore. They reproduce themselves. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you also see the reproduction of the perspective that, you know, black males are to be feared from our own music. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, 
it's interesting. I think Akala makes the perspective that you know, I can talk about I'm gonna kill a nigger in a track, and you know, you always hear, but I kill you, nigger. Yeah. You know, you, you hear it, it's, it's pretty common. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you could never really say that if you're talking to a white artist. You can say, I'm gonna kill you, cracker, and people would not have it, he said. And the fact is that we very easily reproduce the association between, you know, ourselves and violence, you know, ourselves are needing to attack, ourselves are needing to defend. And that in itself kind of frames a fr frames a problem. I think there's a real, I think there's a, definitely a real need to redefine not just what it means to be a black youth, but what it means to be male generally, because we definitely do take our cue from the broader definition of masculinity is. I think that in Bell Hooks's book, um, we real cool. She says, you know, look, this com this definition of masculinity that you see us re reproducing. The irony is that it's not our own. It's not. It's not ours. Mm -hmm. And so, it's anyway. It's a part of the same. You know, the same system. Ironically, that in theory we should be resisting, or we res try to resist in part. I think there's there's room for a conversation as well, which to look at the individual versus the collective when it comes to the definition of black masculinity, or like what it means to be a black man as opposed to be bl black men. Oh yeah, that's interesting. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, well, the reason I mention that in particular is because of artists like Akala and poets who, who have defined a space for themselves in, or carved out a space within a certain infrastructure to say, actually, you know what, I'm a black man and I'm going to talk about that these issues. And it's okay. You know, you know, that's interesting. It's funny that you say that because when you say to me black men and black youth, I think of completely different images. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are those I'm images? What, what, what's what the difference? The, maybe, maybe it's because of my background, but when I see when I see black men, I see I think of just men doing stuff, communities, families, activists. That's that's interesting. You know, would, you I, say, I, right? that, 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 would you say that's more so because of the the circle or the influence that you've had around mm, you? Do you think mm. that's generally the? the I, I was thinking the opposite. Other, I was yeah, thinking exactly, the opposite. I was thinking. Actually, the reason I gave that example is because as an individual black male, you can perhaps get to a certain point that but you're not taking your community with you necessarily. And so actually, these artists are getting to those places and they're respected because they're an artist. You mentioned, um, you know, the, the kind of the mobilization which, which black men had to take, you know, um, to resist racist attacks and, in, in this country. I think that's a really interesting conversation which, which nobody seems to want to talk about anymore. And it's like, how can you forget about these communities which were mobilising themselves against racism? I mean, from a young age, I remember just being out with, with my mum and facing racist abuse. Now, there's a certain element of that, you know, that kind of still lingers in, in society mm -hmm. nowadays, but it isn't as, as widely spoken of because for, for some reason, uh, the majority of society thinks that we live in a post-racial society and racism's mm -hmm. disappeared and there's nothing to worry about now. But when things uh, arise, like the riots, for instance, and we saw that, how a lot of the crimes were immediately being associated with young black mm -hmm. men and just saying, yeah, they were all black, they were all young and black. So there's these generalizations that often pop up in moments of crisis and the culture here in England is to kind of like sweep things under the carpet. We have a very stiff upper lip kind of uh, perspective, uh, even though these are rather painful things that we should be speaking openly about. So let's, I want to bring it back to what Simeon started to talk about is redefining masculinity. He's saying you need to redefine what it means to be a man first and foremost and then we can start talking as well about redefining what it means to be a black man and in your case you introduced also the collective versus the individual which I think is a really really interesting um, way to explore it um, so what do we mean by redef redefinition why does this redefinition need to, need to happen I think that masculinity in itself a large part of it tries to be superhuman and I think that that level of being to be human, not being able to be you know, vulnerable, not able to be struggle, not able to struggle, I think those things there leave people being isolated. The idea of the, of the man being the breadwinner and that being a definitive part of masculinity is a problem. Because now it's in the sense of I am castrated because I am not the breadwinner in my house. And the repercussions of that in a home itself could be quite damaging. I also feel that um, creating a space for women as well and say, well, actually, women need to be in power, women need to be here, women need to be leaders. You need to say to men, well, actually, 
you are not any less of a man for women occupying these spaces. If anything now, men need to be back within the family structure. I, I could imagine being in, in a room now with, with, with white people, um, perhaps who are, you know, middle class white people who would say, no, no, you, you know, that's, that's a black issue. Like, actually, we've overcome that. And they, they would argue that, for example, both the man and the woman are at work. And um, perhaps even the woman's in, in, in a position of power within that structure. But actually, I think the question we need to be, or the, the point that we need to be making is, the structure that they're talking about is still patriarchal. To be a woman in a position of power in a patriarchal structure means you have to adopt patriarchal values. So it's a question of power Men. rather than just man versus woman. In terms of the redefinition redef of uh, masculinity, is something that will benefit both men themselves and women. So men have to see it as not something that is a threat to their power, mm -hmm. but something that will help kind of heal the, the, the turmoils and the tools that, that we're currently going through because hypermasculinity and patriarchy to a certain extent is suicidal. Sorry, so can you lift your hat back? I can't see your eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I thought about that, Just but we look like some that. kind of singing trio or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what oh. you're trying to imply about this. You find this feminine? I don't actually sit like <laughs> this. You find feminine, yo. No, on the say. contrary, I, I find this uncomfortable. Because <laughs> I, feel, I feel too manly now. <laughs> 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 I'm not lying. <laughs> I sit like this. <laughs> it is. It's like you know, men on the trains. <clears throat> I always find that that they just have to go out of their way yeah, to like. Yeah. So you're talking about peak time, like that. That those annoying trains where there's no space, and you have a man sitting like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, and yeah. then he'll take up your seat as well because you know he's like this. To be honest, I'm like, this is really thing is, I think it's either, it's either comfortable like this or comfortable like this. There's yeah, really yeah. any they in between. It's not work. You know what? I like that though. Yeah, that's I like right. that. Nah, it's nah, it's nah, two nah. in one. You get a pilates type <laughs> of stretch. <sweat. laughs> I start to feel some pain. Exactly. I start to feel some pain too. That's the whole point. That's the point. Okay, so.